going to. Uh, it's five minutes in, so we may as well start. All Maybe right. You want to then present the document on the screen. Yep. It's, and uh, Alex, I'm just looking at the the attendees right now because I know about you know half the call was involved in the paper and the other half wasn't. Uh, I know that Clinton asked earlier if, if folks have taken a, a look at it, but maybe we can probably start it out that way again, because I think it's Saad and uh, T. Nelson, sorry, what, what's your first name? Oh, from you. Tony Nelson. Hey, Tony. Thanks hey, for coming. Good seeing you again. Yeah. And uh, John Griffin. I don't know. If, have you guys had a chance to look at that, uh, the white paper? I uh, took a brief look at it yesterday. I haven't really dived into it, just uh, kind of glanced over it. OK, so an overview from uh, Alex would be useful then? Yes. OK, cool. OK, so um, I'll, I'll quickly do a, a, a quick uh, skim through. So what we wanted to do with this, uh, with this document is um, give uh, give the audience uh, an understanding of the storage landscape in terms of both the terminology that's used in this space um, and at some idea of the different types of solutions. Um, and more importantly, what we're trying to do here is, is trying to give people an understanding of the different attributes of a storage system such that they can better pair the application requirements um, to what different storage systems can actually provide in terms of um, attributes like availability, scalability, consistency, uh, performance, that sort of thing. Um, and we, we tried uh, as much as possible to, to keep this um, fairly agnostic um, and, uh, you know, not product specific in any way. Um, and we've minimized the, um, you know, that we only use products where, uh, product terms when, when they are, you know, kind of like obvious, like S3 object stores and things like that. Um, but otherwise we've, we've tried to keep this, um, uh, as a, as a way of getting an understanding of, of the storage environment. Um, and the way, we've, the way we've done this, just as a general layout, is we define the attributes um, of a storage system. Um, we define the, um, the layers that are formed within the, that, that take part of, of a storage service, you know, whether it's um, the way data is protected or or um, you know, different virtualizations or distribution topologies and that kind of thing. Um, and then we dive into the different data access interfaces um, covering two main areas. Um, the first one being volume, where we look at block file system and uh, shared file system. And secondly, what we're calling an application API, where, where an application talks to a storage system over, over an API. So things like um, object stores, key value stores, and, and databases, for example. Um, and then we have um, further sections where uh, a reader can get additional information on um, you know, block storage, file system, object storage, and key value stores specifically. Um, we we just decided to defer databases in general um, to a, a later version of the document, primarily because databases was a really large scope and you know could even be a, a could, it might even merit a document of its own, um, and and also partly just from a pragmatic point of view, from a timing point of view, we just um, it was it was a, a bit of the pie that was too big to bite off um, just now, um, so. So very quickly, we talk about the, the attributes. So we have a section here on the attributes where we talk about things like availability, scalability, performance, consistency, durability. Um, and we put in a small section here about instantiation and how you deploy them. Um, we talk about the layers. There are a couple of small sections in the layers which, which need to be um, fleshed out, but they're identified in the comments. Um, 
we cover things like the topology of the storage system um, and the data protection capability. And we talk about data services like replication and snapshots and encryption, for example. Um, and we have a section on the data access interface. So talking about you know, how workloads actually interface with the, um, with the storage system and how they actually consume storage out of, out of a storage system. Um, and we cover you know, block file system, shared file system, and also object stores, key value stores. As we said, databases were deferred. We are building out a uh, comparison table, and I'm trying to do some work to make this to a pretty diagram rather than just a, than just a table. Um, probably do that in the next couple of days. Um, and then we have some further detail on each of the um, store types. So we have a section on block stores, another one on file systems, uh, another one on object stores, and another one on key value stores. We then also talk about um, how the storage is orchestrated. So talking about the different control plane interfaces between the, um, the container orchestrators and the control plane of the, um, of the storage system. Uh, and we discuss and list um, some of the interfaces there, like the native drivers and the Docker volume plugin, Flex volume, and obviously CSI. Um, and we also um, try to put in uh, some, we also try to cover uh, orchestration uh, interfaces for um, the API components. So, you know, how you orchestrate um, an object store or a database or a key value store, for example. And obviously, you know, the, the volume orchestration is probably more mature at this stage. Um, so, so that, that, has, that has more detail than, than the API section. Um, and then finally, we have the appendix, which has a little blurb around some of the history for the document, um, mostly for um, just informational purposes. And we talk about, um, and, we, and we have coverage around things like consensus protocols um, and consistency, um, which are co fairly complex. Uh, concepts which are again poorly understood, but often referred to inconsistently in different documentation. So um, this kind of gives uh, a nice, uh, a, a nice rounded summary of some of those concepts. There. Questions? Comments? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Like it. Good work. Yeah, obviously I, I'm somewhat biased because I was kind of involved in this, but but I must say I read through, you know, it took a long time to piece all the bits together and there were multiple authors and a lot of document restructuring at the last minute, but reading the final draft, I must say it really comes across as super valuable to me. Um, I. I think it. I hope it will be very well received. I think it gives a very good balanced view of of everything from a factual point of view. And <clears throat> um, I want to congratulate everyone who was involved because I think the end result is very impressive indeed. <clears throat> I had one question actually that only occurred to me after I read the final draft, which is uh, one thing we don't talk about, and it is obviously a bit of a contentious one. So maybe we want to avoid it, but. I think cost and pricing is a is a pretty um, salient property of storage that people take into account when they choose what to use. Um, and I wonder, I don't think we talk about it much. We have that section at the beginning about, uh, what did we call it, uh, provisioning and something. Um, but But I think there's maybe a bit more to say around, you know, service storage services like s3 are typically priced you know with this sort of structure per gigabyte or per iop or whatever it happens to be whereas um 
<clears throat> you know, dev storage devices like uh, storage servers and whatever are, are priced typically this other way. And that may play into which of the two you choose um, in addition to, you know, performance and all the other things. Um, and, and some of them are sort of, some of them are more CapEx focused and others are more OpEx focused, you know, pay as you use versus pay for a big box and use it any way you like. Um, are there any thoughts on whether we should talk about that at all? And is it something we, we can talk about sensibly or is it just too diverse to be able to summarize? Um, I think having, you know, adding a little bit to the deployment options section um, where we, you know, we say we discuss the differences between hardware, software and cloud services, for example, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out cost as a, as a factor there because, um, you know, hardware typically implies CapEx and on the other end of the spectrum, cloud services typically provides, typically implies subscription. However, it is, <laughs> you know, it is, it is, um, it is one of those topics where there are vast ranges of exceptions and all of those things. So, um, as you were talking, I was kind of thinking, you know, could we put relative costs of different systems in there? But then, actually, you know, we could have you could have an object store costing more than a block store, depending on how those things are configured, right? So we're happy. Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking about that the same way too. I, maybe it, you can generalize it, and you can say, you know, most expensive is structured data storage for databases medium is block store and cheapest is object or something like that. But you know, when anyone, anyone picks that apart, like it's not always true. So I think it's tough to really get on those details. And then the other thing I was thinking about is like, what's the audience? Uh, you know, if this is a technical paper, uh, you know, if you start going down that path, like I think to be clear and to be consistent, you have to get into some kind of details there. And is that just gonna add you know, extra to this paper, or confuse the audience or just not be aligned with what our actual audience is. Yeah, those are those are definitely valid points. Uh, just to be clear, I wasn't necessarily um, suggesting that, you know, we say block stores are cheaper than file systems or, or anything like that, <clears throat> but more, um, it's probably more to do with the software-based stuff built on, uh, off-the-shelf hardware has certain pricing properties that are different than proprietary handmade, uh, you know, uh, enterprise storage systems. Now, I know this is going to get controversial, but, and, and maybe, you know, I don't have the, the pricing details mm -hmm. at least off the top of my head, you know, right here, but, but it might be worth saying they're either comparable in price or different in price or you know whatever um yeah. even though it's yeah. it's not a technical decision i think it it sort of inevitably plays into decisions even technical people make uh you know developers are gonna choose in some cases choose something they have easier access to like an open source uh, software based solution that they can download and try out and use in their, you know, small product uh, versus having to justify a uh, large capital expense. So I personally don't think this is the right um, uh, forum for that, that sort of a, uh, I'll, I'll call it a, it's almost kind of a sales pitch, right? <laughs> um, I think, I think it'd be really valuable to, uh, you know, call out the, the different options, but it doesn't seem like trying to associate a cost um, of each one is, is really um, something that you can actually do. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily overly useful um, because you, you don't know what uh, existing hardware folks have. You don't know uh, what kind of contracts they have with vendors, all that sort of thing, right? And you don't know, maybe they don't have uh, a team of developers to work on open source. Um, yeah. 
I mean, that's like, that's like a whole, so I've written and given talks on that topic. Um, and you can write a whole nother paper on that topic. Yeah. And I, and I could definitely like just, uh, John's playing like the devil's advocate here for sure. And he's, you know, background from NetApp, you know, background from EMC on my side. And I, I agree like, uh, from, from EMC's perspective, uh, or, or even I think Dell at this point, I can't speak for Dell because I don't work, work for them at this point, but I think that, uh, you know, an open source solution, you know, when you add it up with the hardware and the people it takes to actually run it, cause you're not getting it supported by an enterprise company, like the costs end up being similar. So, so the, the cost savings is very much a subjective thing that just like John said, you can <clears throat> write a paper about you know, what that translates to an organization, depending on your structure. So, so how about this? Um, I, I, I kind of agree with all of those comments there. I, and I think that trying to compare ranges or pluses and minuses or pros and cons um, is probably not suitable for the documents. However, um, on the other hand, I think it's worth pointing out to a developer who's looking to compare costs. Um, just maybe some basic things like the differences between um, purchasing stuff up front versus purchasing services and subscriptions with the cloud is, is one obvious one. Um, and then I think it's probably also worth pointing out to people that products are generally priced according to the attributes that they support. So for example, um, you know, if a product is focused on uh, um, uh, a capacity attribute like like an object store, it's it's going to be it's going to be priced in terms of dollar per gigabyte. Um, but often, um, both things that you purchase or services that you utilize can be priced in terms of dollars per IOPS um, or dollars per megabytes per second, i.e., dollars per performance. Um, and we should probably also just mention that people need to factor in dollars per availability because often the number of copies or the number of replicas or the number of um, the, the amount of redundancy tends to increase cost. And, and just leave it high level in that respect so that people can say, okay, if we're, if we're, um, if we're looking at things, these are the sort of axes that affect the cost without actually telling them what, cost, what, the, what the costs are, what the ranges are. And I, and I like that. I, I think the generalizing at that level would be useful like if the audience is the developer and it's going to mm -hmm. be more information. I think that makes sense. And you know, the, the comment you had before, uh, you know, how can we break it up? We could say, you know, there's a traditional mode of, you know, the CapEx purchases, you buy everything up front, you know, you run it yourself, you get it supported. There's the, uh, you know, the other model, which is the service-based model. And, you know, that's different for X reasons. And then maybe you could even tee up something in the future for the next white paper, which is, and then there's you know, leveraging cloud native tech to, to run some of these services. And uh, maybe that's a better place to be, who knows. But uh, maybe there's three models that we, we talk about there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like what you said, Alex, as well. And, and I, think, I think not mentioning cost as a consideration uh, when comparing storage alternatives is not the right thing to do. Um, so yeah, just adding that, that is a factor and these are the kinds of things you probably want to think about CapEx versus OpEx uh, per gigabyte versus per IOP, et cetera, and, and leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. Um, now, just in terms of logistics and timing, so there are, there are a couple of sections that um, that need to be filled in. We have people nominated for them, but of course we're also going to have to take on board any feedback that's presented. We were tentatively looking to present, I believe next, is it next Tuesday? At the talk? 
to the TOC. Uh, I actually dropped the TOC an email yesterday to ask them if they want us to present this stuff or if they just want to read the document. And I haven't looked at my inbox yet, but I have, I'm not aware of any replies to that yet. Um, I think let's give it a while. There's certainly no urgency to talk about it there. Um, I, people have not been hounding me. So let's see what they think. Um, I think what we do need to do is talk about it at the, um, at the KubeCon China event uh, in three weeks time, I guess it is. <clears throat> so as long as, as long as by the time we stand up there, there are no, you know, violent objections to our documents, um, I think we're good for that. Um, and I have, as I said, I've sent the document to the TSC. They can read it if they want to. They can uh, reply to my email if they want us to present it to them in a summarized form. So let's, let's just give it a few days. I think what I would like to do is make sure that, that at least some significant number of people outside of the authors of this paper um, show visible evidence of actually having read it and, and provided some feedback. So John, thanks for yours here. Um, and if we can get more, uh, I think that would be great. I wouldn't want it to feel like this document was purely the opinion of the five authors and not an opinion shared by anyone else. That would be bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do we do that? How do we encourage people to, um, to read the doc? Uh, I, I personally, I would give it another few days for people to see your email that you sent out. And we've got this forum. Um, I've announced it. Uh, we have a TSC meeting next Tuesday, Wednesday, I believe, Monday, maybe. Um, so I can, I can verbally tell everyone on that call. Uh, so I didn't want to open it up to too broad feedback just yet until we had uh, let the working group, you know, look at it and comment just because you can become, in, or we can all become inundated with too much feedback and not be able to process it. Um, but if by next week uh, we are not overwhelmed with feedback from the working group itself, then I can announce it at the TOC meeting, uh, which just to be clear includes TOC members, but also typically around 50 to 100 other people. And so I think that'll be an effective way of getting more reviewers if we want more. Okay, sounds good. And then hopefully, again, KubeCon will add yet more interested parties. Uh, we're on the agenda and people will probably sign up to come to that. So come three to four weeks time, I'm guessing we'll have more than enough feedback. And then we can, as I think the plan was to sort of declare it published and final by KubeCon uh, Seattle, which is about a month after KubeCon China. Yeah. So I, th I think that sounds reasonable. Unless anyone's got better ideas. Oh, it, it, that sounds good to me. Um, so I, I guess, apart from you know finishing off the doc and and processing comments, and we probably need to um, we probably need to create a, a draft slide deck uh, by by next week, right? If you're taking that to KubeCon China the week after. Well, I think, I think the conference is on the 13th of November, if I remember correctly. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, within a week, I think the slides are probably supposed to be uploaded already. Um, and we can, we can put a wireframe slide upload there. I don't think they get made public. I think they're just trying to encourage people to make sure they have actually prepared their slide, <laughs> their presentations yeah. more than the night before. Um, but we can certainly uh, amend the slides up until not long before the 13th. Yeah, let's maybe have a draft uh, end of next week if that works okay. I think we've got most of, or some of that anyway. So if I have yeah. a slide deck, uh, then I think we're good. All right, so, so I had that um, first copy of the slide deck from a meetup I had done, so I can, um, if somebody could point me at, at a CNCF sort of template, um, I'll put the content into that and then we can um, iterate on that. Sure, I think I stand corrected, but I think I sent you that 
a couple of weeks ago, but I, I can dig it out again. I don't think there is actually a template, but there is a CNCF a GitHub repo that's got all the logos and uh, it's got some example slide decks and stuff like that. I think that's as close as we get to an actual KubeCon uh, template. Do they usually send out those uh, templates for the previous coupons? I haven't received any. Yeah, I, I had a look around. I can't remember if it was for this group or, or for a different group, but I couldn't find any in my emails or um, on the website. So we had we had a deck that we had uh, cleansed. Um, we had a deck that we had uh, prepared for the storage working group in throw for the KubeCon EU uh, earlier this year. So we just reuse that deck as a template. I'd be fine with that. I don't, I don't think they're very strict about the slides all being consistent, the slide decks for the different presenters being consistent with each other in terms of formatting. All right, I will, I'll use that then. Yeah. I've got it handy now. Just send the link in the chat. Cool. So, All right. Thank you so much for your efforts here. Uh, thank, thank everybody for. Well, thank you everybody actually for for it was a team effort, so we, we did we did good work here, um, and I think this will make it easier for everybody to understand storage going forward. So. Um, uh, if there's anything else, is there anything so else? Or? We do have two talks, right? So the slides that you are preparing, that's for the deep dive, right? For the intro, do we need any, maybe just a few so slides? We can actually talk about what this group is about and what we're going to do with the white paper. So do we need a few slides just to, to cover that? Or is it just a talk? Like, yeah, you're, you're you're probably right. We, we we I think we need we need um, we need an intro talk to just kind of um, cover some of the basic things about the working group and um, sort of a, a high level. We're working on the document, and this is what it covers. And then the deep dive can be um, sort of actual maybe actual sections, or we can discuss some of the sections of the document in a bit more detail, perhaps. So for the intro, maybe we can use some of this uh, the slide that you were just uh, sharing. Yeah. And that, that, this one and see if we can use some of this. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I was thinking too. Okay. Yeah, one thing I've learned from the KubeCons is that um, the, the audience every year, the actual people attending is growing so fast that the percentage of people who've never been to a KubeCon before is pretty high. And this one being the first one in China is going to be even more than even more so than usual. Um, so yeah, don't be too shy to present material that is quite similar to what's happened in the past, just because one, the pre repetition is kind of useful because people forget this stuff. And two, the, the audience is gonna be, I would guess 90% people who've never been to a KubeCon before. So, <laughs> so yeah, reusing what you've got is not a terrible idea. All right, makes sense. Clint, uh, I only really got involved in this group in the last few months, um, and I don't have full visibility into what other things this group has done before I joined. So we might, you know, we've been kind of heads down uh, getting this document published recently, but we may want to reincorporate some of the other things that this group was doing before we dived into the doc. Uh, I know you were, you had some presentations from various um, technology groups and vendors and whatever. Uh, I don't know how well received that was, if it was use, useful use of time, if we want to get that going again, and if there are any projects that we, you know, if we, if we identify, you know, holes in the landscape that we think we want to tackle, uh, I don't know if those kind of discussions have happened before or with uh, scoping. Do, do we actually have a, a like a charter for this working group that says this is what we do and this is what we don't do? I think that's how we initially, like when you joined, that was one of the things we wanted to get from the TOC. 
was to define like what they were looking for from us. And I think the most tangible thing was to start working on a, a white paper. Um, so, so I, I mean, we've like, when, when we look at that deck that was posted by Alex, we do have like on there slide number six, which is what we kind of interpreted as our mandate. And the three things were to, to clarify terminology and landscape, uh, to look at how the components are used in clouds and to compare and contrast properties of storage, such as availability, durability, performance, et cetera. And I think that kind of covers like building the white paper. Um, but I, I'm definitely all ears to hear from folks, you know, what, what they would see as you know, valuable use of time in this working group moving forward, whether it's hearing from other pre you know, presenters, et cetera. So, um, Quentin, just, just for context, um, one of the, one of the things, so, so the, I think there was a lot of debate at the tail end of, of, of last year. And one of the things, uh, I recall on one of the talk meetings was that there was kind of a general consensus that working groups shouldn't exist for the sake of existing, but they exist because they're tasked to do things by the, by the TOC. Um, you know, whether that's, for example, reviewing a project or writing content or, you know, what, whatever that thing might be. So I, so I think we probably have an agenda item as this sort of document now comes to a close as to what we do next. And that's kind of where you come in. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think there's a sort of a bi-directional aspect to this. So I think on the one hand, um, the TLC wants to uh, know what's going on in the storage world and find out where the problems are and find out, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and when I say the TOC, I, I think I'm making up requirements of the TOC. I'm not aware of anyone having, anyone else having said, we want the storage working group to do this. I believe this working group was kind of spawned of its own accord. So I'm not sure that the TOC actually requested that a storage working group be put together and answer the question X, Y, Z. It's more that it, it self formed. Um, and then the TOC was saying, well, what is this working group actually doing? What, what is their scope? What do they plan to do? Um, and that's where, that's where the conversation started. So, um, I'm, I think we can propose what we want to do and what we want to provide to the TOC and to the CNCF in general. Uh, and as long as the, TO, the, the CNCF does not object to that, I think we're good. Or yeah. the TOC. Um, off the top of my head, the things that I would imagine that would be very well received are, so this document is a good starting point. The other thing that I believe that people are very interested in and which we didn't actually cover very well in this document in, in any detail is, is how are these things actually used. So one thing we could do is um, publish case studies of, you know, some of the details of how um, particular use cases exist. Uh, we could get guest. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of uh, someone like GitLab just to take something off the top of my head. So how does GitLab do their storage behind the scenes? And what are the problems they've had? And I know they just migrated from one place to another place for reasons. Um, I would imagine that people would be very interested in understanding how GitLab does their storage, why they do it that way, what they did in the past. Um, now that could be somewhat contentious. Um, I, I clearly would not want a big user to stand up and say, we hate cloud provider X <laughs> Z, and we love cloud provider Y. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a genuine interest in understanding how some of these things are actually done behind the scenes. And some companies will be prepared to, you know, um, talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine Netflix is another example, which is a big high profile thing where um, people must wonder like, how the hell do they store all these movies and uh, <laughs> metadata and, and are they prepared to tell us, you know, about their journey there? So yeah. that, that seems like a, a, an interesting area we could explore either with presentations or with documents or whatever. Mm. I, I'm wondering if, you know, we've, I think we've got a good outcome of 
you know, the working group for creating this document. And Quentin, to rewind, like the TOC did ask to form it, and that's when Ben kind of stepped up and said, okay, you know, I'll lead it for the TOC report back. So I do believe it was like four okay. created. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the tangible outcome of it has been one, like, you know, bringing folks together. At one point we had 30 or 30 people or so like that were joining the call continuously. And I think that was when we were doing a lot of our presentations or even maybe when the white paper was first discussed because people were really interested in what was going on. Uh, and then we had the white paper and I think we've had a little bit of a tailing off of, of attendance at this point. But my, my, my thoughts are kind of like in terms of timing and where we're at, like within the conference season and the year, like this seems like a great outcome of the working group. And, and it's something that I'm kind of interested to see like how it goes. Like what's the feedback from it? You know, d does the CNCF and TSC find this really useful? You know, was this a good use of our time? And, and maybe it's, and considering we have KubeCons coming up, et cetera, maybe it's like we take a little bit of a break on a working group. And then next year we, we address, all right, like what's the next thing that TOC actually wants considering you know, what the feedback was from the paper and like, and how we, how we, uh, what was presented. Yeah, that sounds like a perfectly reasonable um, approach. Uh, so I'll tell the TOC we're basically calling this task done, and based on the up, based on the feedback to the document, we will decide whether we want to reconstitute in the new year for the next step. Um, and then I would propose that in the next step, we come forward and say these, based on the feedback we've received, uh, we think this these three things would be the next logical steps for this working group. And we're essentially reforming to do item number one on that group list, or maybe two or three in parallel. I'm not sure. That depends how it works out. I think that would be totally reasonable. Uh, I think the, the TOC would welcome proposals from us as to what we think we should do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, rather than us saying, what do you want us to do? Because I, I think we're, less likely to get useful feedback from that right or instructions Alex, what do you think? yeah no i mean that 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 makes sense um i think getting feedback from uh, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that there will be some obvious takeaways once people have enough people have reviewed the document and we've talked to this about that we've talked about this in in Kubicon and one thing that might actually be really useful is to actually, um, you know, poll the audience when we do these sessions at KubeCon as to what, uh, I, I don't know if we're going to be good enough, I don't know if we're going to be ready enough to give them a couple of options, but maybe ask them what they want to see next, what they see their pain points are, or what their decision points are issues you know they, they might say actually well this is all great but what we really want is a roadmap on csi next for example or something i i, I don't know you know so i'm just making stuff up like, like when, when csi and the cncf or like something like that right i think that's the there's definitely things that are going to happen in the next six months that are going to change the storage landscape and maybe there's other opportunities to come up yeah so 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 maybe we maybe we ask and see and see what comes back um, but I'm hoping that there will be a, a few things that might be you know immediate follow-up directly from this document so, so somebody might say well okay this is great but actually I don't think you captured this area and we might have a separate document or we might have a separate discussion or some other project presentations or whatever related to that for example uh, hey I, I had a quick question um, if so, so if I share this document with with folks, say in my company, uh, how would what's the best way for them to provide feedback for it? Um, probably directly on the document, I think. Okay, gotcha. I just want to make sure that there's some what, what the recommended way is what I give them. So, if it's just directly on the document, I'll tell them that. Yeah. All right. And thanks. Obviously, this this forum would be an alternative. So, so they're welcome to come to this meeting. Um, and and provide i mean first prize is written comments in the document um, but sometimes comments are more usefully presented verbally to people saying look i read the thing i didn't quite know where to put this but my feeling is xyz and <clears throat> that's also fine okay cool thank you very much and maybe we should make that known like 
in terms of the, the, I don't know if you said that in your email, Alex, but I think we've got three of these sessions leading up to KubeCon. And, you know, if you have the comments to come to these sessions to verbalize them, because I, I totally agree. I think that that's probably a better forum for some discussion. Yeah, okay. I can, I can have a follow-up email next week then. I think it was fairly clear in the, in the one you sent, but uh, never heard to send the follow-up. Um, so, so just to briefly circle back, and then I think we're probably done. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that at KubeCon Shanghai and KubeCon Seattle, um, we can solicit audience input as to what... So, so first of all, make them aware of the document and, and uh, tell them this is you know, basically, certainly by Seattle, this is kind of delivered. Um, and then solicit feedback on whether and if and what sort of next steps they would like the working group to take and have in the wings uh, a set of proposals just, I mean, rather than we end up with a room full of goldfish not able to make decisions, <laughs> we can, without preempting the input we might get, we can at least have in the wings uh, a set of potential proposals to get people thinking. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thanks all. Yep. Thank you all. See ya. Bye.